This month, we sat down with Dr. Walt Wolfram before he delivered the first Apple Lecture of 2023 for the Applied Linguistics and TESOL program at Teachers College, Columbia University. There is a link to his lecture in the description below. Walt Wolfram is the William C. Friday Distinguished University Professor at North Carolina State University, where he also directs the Language and Life Project. He has pioneered research on social and ethnic dialects since the 1960s and published 23 books and more than 300 articles. Over the last two decades, he and his students have conducted more than 3,500 sociolinguistic interviews with residents of North Carolina and beyond. In addition to his research interests, Professor Wolfram is particularly interested in the application of sociolinguistic information to the public, including the production of television documentaries, the construction of museum exhibits, and the development of innovative formal and informal materials related to language diversity for different institutions. He has received numerous awards, including the North Carolina Award, the highest award given to a citizen of North Carolina, the Caldwell Humanities Laureate from the North Carolina Humanities Council, the Holiday Medal at North Carolina State, the Board of Governors Halshauser Award for Excellence in Public Service, and the Linguistics Language, and the Public Award from the Linguistic Society of America. He has been inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and served as president of the Linguistic Society of America, the American Dialect Society, and the Southeastern Conference on Linguistics. Thank you so much for joining us here today, Dr. Wolfram. Um, on behalf of the Studies in Applied Linguistics and TESOL Journal here at Teachers College, um, we'd like to thank you for taking the time to chat with us, and I'll just get started with our first question, if that's My okay. Pleasure. Um, so, how did you first become interested in linguistics and in the study of American dialects in particular? <laughs> uh, it's actually sort of an experiential story. I, uh, my parents were German immigrants, and so they didn't speak much English. But I was born in 1941, which was not a good time for Germans <laughs> in the United <laughs> States. Okay, and so, and so uh, one of the things that I noticed early was I did not want to be German. I wanted to be American because of the stigma, you know, whenever the kids played war games, who's going to be the German and die? <laughs> so, so, but in order to become Americanized, as I thought of it, because I went to a German church, we lived in a German community, my parents spoke German and so forth. Uh, what happened was I started paying close attention to English speakers and the norms they used. And so while I was doing that, I wasn't thinking about future professions, I was just thinking about how I would, could not be sort of a German nerd. Um, and, so, and so I started noticing a lot about the English variety and, and found out later that I had really sensitized myself to it. Uh, I, of course, the, the problem was that I only knew one dialect, which was North Philadelphia. Uh, I didn't travel a lot because my parents had six kids who were poor. And, and so what I thought was the English language was the English of North Philadelphia. <laughs> Which I later realized when I went to college was not exactly sort of the normative variety of English that was spoken around the United States. And so, and so that sort of motivated me even more. And so I gradually uh, to sort of build up an affinity and sensitivity to sort of observing and assimilating language, and that's how it started. And then, of course, when you get into college, everybody is looking for courses that they're better than than other <laughs> students, you know. And I was, and so when it got to languages, I started studying Greek and Latin and Spanish and so forth, and I realized, well, um, oh, I got these languages better than other people. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're inclined to do things that we're better at. <laughs> And that's how I got. In, that's how I got into a sort of linguistics. Uh, you know, I was I was a fine student in other areas, but I seemed to sort of excel when it came to languages. And then I studied language structure 
and found that linguistics was the same way. And so I just sort of, I didn't know what to do in life, and so I just continued. <laughs> I actually originally wanted to be a missionary. And so, uh, so I studied it for that. And then uh, when that didn't work out, uh, you know, for both sort of logistical reasons, because we couldn't raise the money to go, and for sort of theoretical reasons, because I was fast losing my sort of Christianity, <laughs> uh, then we sort of, I needed a job, and so I went into linguistics. <laughs> yeah. It was a much better job market then. <laughs> <laughs> for the record. Yeah. No. Well, next, um, we'd like to ask you about some of your research, starting with the Language and Life Project. Um, so, as we understand it, you and your team use sociolinguistic research to gather and document information and teach and engage with the public about linguistic diversity and difference. So, what would you say are some of the notable impacts of this project? Well, the, the notable impact is that uh, North Carolina is probably a more dialectally sensitive, pe more people are aware of dialects in North Carolina over the last 30 years because we've done a 15 TV documentaries, we've worked in 26 different communities, sort of in extended ways, and, um, and we are at the state fair each year. We give out 7, 000, over 7,000 buttons and so forth. So, so we have a really comprehensive program that ranges from a curriculum that we develop for eighth grade students to sort of getting lots of publicity and showing our documentaries and so forth. And, and that's eventually, um, and we've also, we've also written uh, popular books, like one of our books is uh, commonly used by teachers. Uh, it's called Talking Tar Heel, and it has, it was the first linguistics book to have 130 QRs. So, we, you know, we have all of these recordings and these uh, videos, and so, and so a person can not just read about it because, you know, so you can read about sort of like, okay, what's the meaning of bless your heart? But to sort of see somebody enact it and talk about it is a very different experience because language is a lot easier to demonstrate than it is often to describe. And, and so we've used, we've used that medium as well. So, so we've actually really uh, done well. Of course, we, we have a, a a YouTube channel that has over 20 million views and 60,000 subscribers, which is more than the Linguistic Society of America. You know? <laughs> so, uh, so I give, I give uh, rotary talks all the time, you know, because I'm the only person who'll get up six o'clock in the morning to go to the rotary <laughs> club. So we do so many things in so many areas that it's not uh, infrequent for me to go into a store and say, uh, I, I think I've seen you on television. You do dialects or something like that. So it's a really, really uh, rich. And there's another thing. North Carolina, as with some southern states, is a state that loves itself. So it loves its writers. It loves its poets. It loves its uh, performers, you know, uh, singers. It even likes topography from the mountains to the ocean. And, and so one of the things, one of the things I've tried to do is build language heritage. I say, y'all love these great things about North Carolina. Why are you so ambivalent about your language? This is part of your legacy. And, and so uh, people are willing to at least listen to that and, and run with it, you know, and they pick up our pins and they like that. So we try to, we, we try to democratize language in a sense and use a bunch of medium about it. So we show films in high schools, in the colleges around it, and so forth, you know. So, so, so we use lots of different venues uh, to get our word out. So speaking of your research in North Carolina, did you know you wanted to study North Carolina's linguistic diversity, or did you realize how diverse the language use was once you started teaching in North Carolina? Well, <laughs> as, as I often said, <laughs> I died and went to dialect heaven. <laughs> I think I had been to North Carolina once in my life before I got a cold call from them. And then when, uh, when my wife and I decided to go there, uh, we decided that we would devote our life, 
well, I would devote my life to studying dialects of North Carolina because it was so cool and it was such a sort of a available resource and opportunities for uh, dissemination and so forth. So, so basically, I decided when they offered me the right amount of money for the job. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Um, so you're originally from Philadelphia, yeah. and now you're doing North Carolina. So you've collected a lot of data from communities all across the United States, um, and a lot of those communities you're not originally a part of. So how do you come into these communities, build their trust, and then authentically represent the dialects in your yeah. work? Uh, that, that's a really good question. Um, basic, basically, what are the advantages of coming from a working class background uh, and I'm the only college graduate in my family out of out of six kids and my parents had an eighth grade is you stay humble in terms of other people and and in terms of the communities we work with uh, I always try to sort of be appreciative of their knowledge you know people know so much more about the water and the coast than I do, you know, I've never caught a fish in my life because I grew up in Philadelphia. <laughs> and, so, and, so, and so there's a sense in which I'm very comfortable with those sorts of situations because that's what my family is like. And so when we go into it, and when we go into it, you know, I realize that degrees and academic status are absolutely irrelevant and at best a detriment not an asset, and so, and so I try to use that. As one guy once said, when uh, we're out on the we're out on the sound, and and he threw me a uh, he threw me a, a a rope to tie up to a flounder, you know, pole. In the, I said, I wasn't in Boy Scouts. I don't know how to tie these kind of ropes. Ropes, and, and he said, he said, well, you're the dumbest smart guy I've ever met in my life. <laughs> in a sense. I can I consider that a compliment because what it says is sort of like you're like us but you don't know much about how we do our lives and we can sort of be the experts for you mm -hmm. and and so whereas someone I said well I don't want to be a smart guy you know and I've had students who've gone with us to the island and they try to sort of exhibit their knowledge about fishing they don't want to hear it <laughs> they want to hear from dumb guys so so, so in a sense I, I, I try to be humble and I found, I found that uh, while there are certainly obstacles, me as an old white guy working in a, a sort of a, uh, an African American community or an American Indian community, well, there are certainly disadvantages. It can compensate uh, to some extent simply because of who you are and how you interact. Plus, one of our favorite communities where we work, Oprah Coat, has a has a strong appreciation for humor, and so I tried to be sort of funny. I'm not sure, I was that, <laughs> but I tried. So so they appreciate that, and uh, and since I was pretty jovial kind of person and like to joke around and so forth, so so that facet of my personality works. But you know, there are there are still obstacles, and I, and I understand that. So you live with it. But you do your best, and I, I figure, I, I figure that authentic sincerity and uh, sort of openness are something that you can work as an advantage in the field. So that's what I do. Awesome, thank you. Um, so you've introduced the principle of linguistic gratuity, um, which is the idea that language researchers should give back in some way to the communities they collect data from. So in your 2008 paper with Jeffrey Reeser and Charlotte Vaughn, you gave some examples of how this principle could be put into practice, um, similar like through documentaries, museum exhibits, and curricula. Uh, was there some specific experience or event that led you to developing and promoting this principle? <laughs> First, I'll tell you a sort of funny story, okay? That I, had, I actually coined a term the principle of linguistic gratuity as a joke on LaBeouf. 
<laughs> and an earlier, and an earlier, LeBov loves principles, right? Yeah. And so he was talking about objectivity and involvement, and so he came up with these principles. One was the principle of uh, of uh, wrongness incurred, or something like that. You know, so it's sort of, dude. That's not a principle. That's just, a, that's just a way of behaving, right? <laughs> and so, so when we were talking about this, I thought, okay, Bill loves his principles, so I'm going to pull one on him and call it and, and use some big ass words and call it the principle of linguistic gratuity. And the next thing I know, the next thing I know, it's my life legacy. And I introduced this principle, which was really just intended as a joke on the ball. I'm not sure he ever got it. <laughs> I appreciate it. But that's how, that's how that turned out. But, but it's nice, you know, and, and, uh, and one of the things you learn from that is sort of like uh, if you have names for things, it's uh, people are much more likely to sort of recognize these kinds of things and so like so my my stance on the uh, uh, on uh, African American English is sort of somewhere between the Creolists and the Anglicists you know but I actually gave it a term and therefore with the term you get credit for <laughs> so so there's a little bit there's there's a little bit of sort of marketing that's involved in this and uh, and one of the things that I learned about myself is that uh, is that I'm a, I'm a bit of an entrepreneur, and so you know, so we started this whole sort of documentary series. There isn't a linguistic department in the world that has two full-time videographers. All right, but we started doing uh, documentaries. I hired a guy on uh, uh, on discretionary and grants. And then after we had become known and won a couple of Emmys, I went to the I went to the school and said, you know, I think that the school should pick up this person. And so the department and the dean they they pay for one of our documentarians now, and the other one I pay for out of a, out of funding and discretionary funds. And so I'm willing to sort of look at opportunities. And the guy that I hired. You know, he walked into my office one day about 25 years ago. He said, I just got a degree in film studies. I said, and I heard that you might be interested in somebody doing documentaries. So I said, are you any good? <laughs> now, now that, sounds like, that, sounds like, that sounds like a crass statement, but actually it's very diagnostic because what I'm looking for is, is this guy, is this guy uh, sensitive enough to say that he's good without bragging to me. And he did an awesome job of that. You know, I said, we'll hire you and we'll work with you. And he's been with me for 25 years. So, so, so there are, uh, you know, and so one thing leads to another, you know, and, uh, and so uh, at one point we said, well, you know, uh, it'd be good to sort of um, have a stand at the fair, you know, on the dialects of North Carolina, uh, where a million people come every year. State fairs are really big in the South. And, you know, what do people like at state fairs? Oh, they like buttons. So we have, uh, we have now about 20 dialect buttons that people pick up. Every year we have a new one or two buttons that they can pick up, and people have them on their backpacks and so forth. And so these sort of little gimmicks, to, you know, we also have sort of interactional kinds of monitors so they can hear a person, guess where they're from, and then learn where they're from and stuff like that. But, but it's, it's, it's these little gimmicks that people remember, and that also sort of uh, get out the knowledge. And you know, we have our website on there and so forth. So, so you, you sort of uh, uh, nothing. I never imagined a life like this, because you know, I was being I was born before word processing, copying, <laughs> and computers. You know. But, but one of the things about education is, you know, if you, if you don't commit yourself to a life of education and being an early adopter of changes, you're going to get left behind. And so, so while it's a struggle, you know, uh, my wife taught me how to type in graduate school because when I went to school, boys didn't type. 
Only girls typed, right? I never knew a boy who was in a typing class. Only girls in the secretarial track, that's what they called it, right? Yeah. Would type. Yeah. And so she said, look, I'm not typing your papers. Here's where you put your fingers. And this one moves that way and the other one moves that way. And so she said, start typing your papers. And that's what I did. I think you've answered both of my questions about um, documentaries. Um, Jessica, do you want to yeah. do the next? Um, so you've written extensively about embracing diversity of dialects, and we're interested in how these ideas might translate into written contexts. So what do you see as the place for the role of dialectal, uh, dialectical diversity in academic writing? Uh, that's an issue. Uh, one of the things that one of the things that we do is we're in an English department, and so uh, we teach all of the new seven thousand students writing in our department, and we have a linguistic diversity ambassadors group of graduate students. What we do is we've developed a curriculum where all of the kids in freshman writing can can get a lecture on language diversity and what it means about intelligence what it means about academic versus local writing and so forth so that so that students are aware and introduced to some of the myths that exist you know so for example we 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 talk to the students about sort of like how how dialects have rules they're not a collection of errors as they've been taught you know and so we we confront a lot of these myths and then some of the students will actually even will even put statements into their syllabi that say, uh, you know, that say we will not penalize you for writing in forms that are from your dialect. You know, if you want us to work with you on it, we will do that, but we, you will not be penalized because it, it's, it's not a function of sort of writing per se. So, 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 so that, that's one of the nice things about being in an English department where all this stuff is done. And also, you know, composition teachers, younger composition teachers are more informed of diversity and so forth. But we, we try to get them to put policy statements about how they're going to treat uh, dialect thing related things in their writing. Yeah, really cool. Um, so you've shared a lot of your impactful projects that you've been working on. How do you see these evolving in the future? <laughs> you know, it's sort of, in one respect, you know, it's uh, it's difficult to envision what the world's going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, by the same standard, you know, you have to be ready for change. And, and one of the things we found, we found is that uh, universities tend to be slow in that regard, so we constantly find ourselves ahead of the university. So, for example, uh, we have we have a uh, electronic store where we sell products, everything from T-shirts to buttons to uh, to DVDs. Okay, but nobody buys DVDs anymore because they don't use them. Okay, so we now have a very robust YouTube channel which has over 20 million views and 60,000 subscribers. Okay, and so we asked the university. Uh, if we could get the proceeds from the ads that they show because yeah. they're a profit. They said they didn't have a mechanism and so we said okay. So we set up a mechanism which is my credit card. <laughs> <laughs> and every month I now get a, I, I now get about a thousand dollars from the ads on there which then I turn around and donate to the university. Right. So, 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 you, so you have to be, you, you have to be sort of a step ahead and, and in sync with, uh, in sync with sort of a digital, uh, uh, you know, changes to sort of take a heed of that. But I, I find universities somewhat frustrating in that regard, you know. So first, when we had a store, we did it with PayPal. Well, that, that doesn't work because then you have to give the money and the transactions can be embezzled or whatever. But and and then we and then we had a Yahoo store, okay, and they said, oh, you can't use Yahoo stores anymore, and then they gave us this clunky thing that was set up for donations and said, do your store on that, which was awful, you know. So, but uh, but uh, in a sense, 
one of the things I do is I don't worry about that. I do something, and if they tell me it's wrong, then I apologize and comply with them. And I get in trouble occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> well, because, I mean, I mean, let's face it, you know, if the university realized that I was getting a thousand dollars a month in my checking account, all right, <laughs> and sort of using it for my own, you know, affairs, mm -hmm. then uh, that would be problematic. But I turn around and I give well exceed in excess of that to the university. So, so when they come around and say, oh, you can't do that, you know, are you embezzling funds? I said, no, look at what I've given to the university and here's my checking account. And then they say, well, we'll do, do this the right way now. So, <laughs> I, I mean, I don't, I, I, don't, I don't mean that to sort of, uh, uh, to, to undercut university practices, but things happen fast in the business world, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I have a couple of sons who are venture capitalists, and they can't believe how slow universities are to sort of capitalize on profits and so forth. You know, I said, look, if you, if they, if you're, if you were in the business world, you would figure out in a hurry how to get that money. <laughs> but universities are in a different, uh, and, and so my feeling is you, you have to sort of be innovative and uh, front and center and sort of lead the university until you get fired for a bit. <laughs> 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 maybe, maybe let's not send out this. Honestly, I'm also sort of a, I'm also um, a bit of a risk taker, which you have to be if you're going to be an entrepreneur. And so sometimes I get called on the carpet by the university. So they <laughs> <laughs> I won't give you the examples. <laughs> <laughs> <Darn>. <laughs> well, that would have been great. <laughs> oh, well, then I'll give you. <laughs> so, so recently, one of the things I do for my students is I buy them snacks. And so the, the deal is that if they if they get the snacks, uh, I'll give them the car and the, and the credit card they can get. So one of my students took my car and crashed it and totaled it, right? Okay, so the head of the department said, oh, is the university liable? So she started calling around. And the next thing I know, I had a, I had a mandatory appointment with the legal officers of the universities because if a student is doing that, even if it's for students but it's your car, they, it may be sort of an indirect sort of, well, are you violating your status right. as a professor? Mm -hmm. And then there was another occasion where I took students on a party bus to, to a screening of one of our documentaries. And, in the, and, and uh, I put some pictures on Facebook of us drinking together. Everybody was legal and so mm -hmm. forth. And that they were upset that they would show a uh, professor drinking with students because of its sort of presentation. Mm -hmm. But, okay, so, so <laughs> that, was, that was the problem. Here was the explanation that they didn't buy that much. I said, you know, in part I can understand, you know, how it doesn't look good for me to be a professor. But I also want you to know that my view on the status between professors and graduate students is top heavy and oppressive. And that grad graduate students are often considered to be the underlings and there's oppression involved with that. So ideologically, my approach is to view it more as a collaboration and to work with them more as, I know it's simulated, but in a sense as equals and we're doing these things together, you know. Those kids who went on a party bus and never been on one before, they'll remember that the rest of their lives. And what a good evening they had watching with the community, sort of uh, one of our films on Talking Black in America. <laughs> and so, so I explained that to them, that while I could understand their point, part of it was ideologically driven and not simply, and not simply me sort of wanting to flout you know, university right. standards. Right. I don't think they got it, but, <laughs> but at least they got a rationale. 
<laughs> you can do with whatever you want. <laughs> <That's how laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> All right, well, it's connecting it back to our university here at Teachers College. Many of us are language teachers. So how can an understanding of sociolinguista- sociolinguistics help us be better educators? Well, one of the things that I do uh, at the start of every semester is bringing, bring in something from, from sort of the outside world, you know, that relates to a language issue. You know, and it's easy these days sort of in terms of, uh, you know, in 1973, Dwight Bollinger published an article called Truth as a Linguistic Question. You know, we have all these issues of truth, so we talk about sort of what is truth, you know, how how the conversation can be direct and indirect, you know, so, so uh, I was just talking last week to a law school, uh, talking to them about sort of Trump's statement, if I could only find 11,000, so many 80 votes, you know, and, and was he, at, is that, when he said, if I could just find, you know, there's a presupposition that they're there to be found, then the question is, is that an indirect directive? That he's liable for it. is he telling them to, to get those and, and so you you see how complicated these things again and there's always something there's always something about language prejudice and so i so i try to say that this is not simply a matter of esoteric linguistics this is the stuff we live by you know and then i'll tell and then i'll tell an example okay so when i was a young man uh i had a mother for whom literal truth was sort of God's dictation from the for the world, and so when a young woman would call me on the phone, and I didn't want to talk to her, I could not stay in the house. I had to go out the front door and close the door, and then she could say he's not here. <laughs> but the question is not is Walt there? The question is. Is Walt accessible for a telephone call, right? Yeah, right? But she interpreted literally and said, Well, Walt, step out the door. I'd step out the door and then she'd tell the truth. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> but, 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 but the point is, the point is, we all have these sort of uh, episodes. So, for example, the student who crashed my car a couple of weeks ago, all right, she hit a truck from the back. All right. So when I come back, I talk to her, you know, and she says, well, I slowed down, you know. But the immediate question is, were you texting? Were you looking at your phone, you know? But I didn't ask her that. I said, well, why didn't you ask her? Well, first of all, she, I suspect she wouldn't tell me the truth. <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, I didn't want to indirectly accuse her of doing that you know what were you doing that you ran into the back of a bus a truck so 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 to sort of use these everyday examples you know help people understand that that language analysis is is a sort of code we live by and we do all of these things that we study and they're essential to our life you know so so that's one of the things that i try to do and uh, and bring in all kinds of examples, you know, like news articles on sort of professionals' assessment of women's uptalk and, and creaky voice and stuff like that. So so we discuss a lot of that in class. And so people, I, I want them to understand that linguistics, while it can be esoteric, is totally meaningful in terms of how we live our lives. Definitely, yeah. That's great so. advice, yeah, for how teachers should start. Um, so, you're giving a lecture tonight. Um, can you give our audience just a few highlights of the Campus Infusion Model Program for Language Diversity that you're going to talk about? Yeah, it, it's really kind of interesting because we, uh, uh, we started a campus-wide program. Uh, and, and I say it's an infusion model because, first of all, it's not just linguists. So there's a, so there's a person in the sort of hierarchy of uh, office development and a person in education, and the three of us work together, okay? So in that sense, it's not just the linguist yelling at the rest of the uh, at the university. It, it, it's, a, it's a program. The, the other thing is uh, we focused on, uh, on new students, 
So we developed a video that they could show, see during a student orientation about language diversity. We also focus on staff. So for example, there's, there's no, we don't have unions because we're in the South, mm -hmm. but, but there is a sort of staff, there, there's, a, there's a, a staff group that meets, so we talk to them about language prejudice, you know, and they could really relate to it because of how professors are with them and so forth. And we talk to students in the dorms. So, so we actually have this very sort of pervasive program. We have, a, if you come to our university, You'll, you'll, we've branded, we've branded our, our program, uh, so, it, so it's called Howl, um, Howl with an accent because our, our mascot is the wolf pack. And so we have a picture of a wolf and then we say, and, and, then, and then it's Howl with, a, Howl with an accent and the idea, and, and these are on monitors all over campus. You know, you come out here and you see a monitor that advertises, so, so we do that. And uh, we've given over 50 workshops. We have resource materials. We provide lectures for English classes and other classes. And we participate uh, robustly in diversity uh, and diversity uh, activities. We had this program before the big diversity push in, the tw in uh, uh, 2020. But actually, we've also participated in that and said, look, we've been doing this before, and this is why it's so critical. So, 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 uh, so one of the things that I'm going to challenge uh, the group with, with, you know, so what is Columbia University doing about this? Do you have a statement somewhere about this, you know? Are you working proactively, you know? If so, I mean, because right next, right next to us, you know, we have a sociology department that uses deficit models of language in their study of language and social class, you know? Uh, sort of a, uh, you know, we have a speech pathology department, you know, uh, we have a, uh, we have an education department and all of these departments sort of in some way deal with language diversity and linguists sort of sit in the corner in their own little enclave and talk to each other instead of sort of working with these working with these folks to sort of wrestle with these things. So, so th that's kind of my challenge for you that I'll leave with you today. Uh, we've done it, you know, but there are still challenges for us, you know. So for example, I'm talking next week, we have a big diversity week initiative, okay. Yes, most universities do nowadays, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, so the question is, okay, so we did this program and won a national award, but are you sustaining it? Or are you just happy that we sort of did it for a year and won a national award? You know, and, and so I'm going to challenge the diversity officer. <laughs> I'm not afraid to challenge people. You do have to challenge them. You know, what are you doing with linguistic inequality on our campus right now? So, so, so in that respect, uh, you know, you have to push uh, and it has to be sort of a, a, a round you know, bottom up from the kids themselves who study it to um, we have a statement by the chancellor, you know. I just texted them and said, hey, we need a statement from you. You know, we're, we're doing this thing for campus and within an hour he was out on the steps uh, spewing his <laughs> views of how diverse we are and what a wonderful university with kids from all counties and and a hundred and some nations and you know all of those things <laughs> so, so yeah so so this is sort of i mean what i'm going to talk to about is the research that we did with both students and faculty because it was research based and then the program that we developed and then sort of like a, a challenge universities and i've i've given similar talks elsewhere, you know, I gave one at Rutgers uh, last year and I've given around the states, you know, what are universities doing to actually ensure that language equality is not dismissed? Because if you think of the, you know, schools have diversity canons, everything ends up in a canon, right? And, and so, yeah, we all know that it's gender, sex, ethnicity, religion, you know, where's language? Language tends to be dismissed or ignored. 
and my feeling is yet, how can you talk about sex and gender without talking about language? You know, how can you talk about ethnicity without including language? And, and so my point is that, uh, is that every university should have a component that is strongly language-based in nature. So the question then is, what are you going yeah. to do? I was just going to say, what yeah. can we do to change that? Yeah. <laughs> well, and I mean, well, I'm, not, I'm not here just to give an interesting talk. <laughs> I'm here to give an interesting challenge. Right, right. We like the challenge. Yeah, and now we know the challenge so we can start thinking about it before the talk. Right. right. It's like yeah. Maybe I'll have an answer. I don't yeah. know. Um, so, uh, in addition to your documentaries, you've published several books intended for a public audience. Um, the three of us as sort of like junior scholars um, are very interested in getting our own work out into the public. Uh, do you have any advice for how you have gone about making your work more public or how future researchers can? Yeah, well, uh, it, it's not as easy as it seems to write for popular audiences. You know, I learned, uh, I learned, for example, we did our first book on the Outer Banks in 1996. And I learned that people don't want to read 30 pages about grammar. <laughs> you know? So, so one, of the, one of the things that I've learned, I've learned was, is keep your chapter short. And, uh, you know, five pages. That, that's about what people will read. I mean, that's even true of students in classes now. <laughs> Damn, they're asking us to read an article that's 50 pages long. You know? Okay, secondly, use technology. So, for example, our, uh, our book, Talking Tar Heel, you know, which is written for a very popular audience, has 130 QRs. So, all the stuff we talk about, you can then see. All you need is a phone. You know, and everybody, if you don't know how to use QRs now, you can't get a meal in some yeah. places. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so all you need, you need to do is click it and you can see. So rather than me give you a definition of, of what bless your heart means, you know, that's, it's a linguist sort of, you know, mm -hmm. can you hand me a compliment if it's an old person? I'm going to show you an example mm -hmm. and how these people talk about it and how they use it and so forth. And so, so we find uh, that that's very attractive to people and actually uh, every summer I teach about a hundred teachers and we then have exercises from the book that they can give to their students in high schools and middle schools and so forth and so, and so we've found that it's sort of and also people who are just interested in North Carolina you know a lot of people oh I'm interested in the dialects of North Carolina when I read this you know so it's, my wife my wife was not a graduate college graduate but is a prolific reader, you know, reads everything she can, you know. So she was my test case. And so I brought home the book. I said, you might find this book interesting. I know you haven't read my other book because they're pretty boring. <laughs> so, 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 so I just left it there and I noticed that it was sort of slowly that <laughs> the bookmark was changing, but it wasn't the speed. So after about a half a year, she finished it. <laughs> and, and, and so I, I sort of gave her the question that no spouse or author should ever ask their spouse, so what did you think of it? <laughs> and she said, you know, it's really interesting, but you can put it down. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not a mystery now, but you really need to read the next chapter, you know, but, you know, and, and writing for those audiences is really difficult, you know, in that respect, I really, uh, I, I really respect people, you know, like Deborah Tannen and John Brickford and so forth who can write for those audiences, and I have learned a lot, and we're now doing another book uh, on that topic, and with, you know, with each one, We've gotten better, but we're still not great. But I do have sort of advice, you know, think uh, think of your audience, you know, my audience with my wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think the technology aspect is really sort of the wave of the future, like yeah. getting your work out. It was kind yeah. of interesting because we went, when we went to uh, North Carolina University Press, you know, uh, I said, well, you know, we'd like to, uh, th th this was about six years ago, I said, well, 
Well, we would like to include QRs. We said, well, we don't have a real a website that, you know, it's fit for that. I said, come on, this is what publishers are going to be doing. You know, get with the game. I said, well, I said, okay, I'll tell you what, we'll do the website for you. <laughs> we did the yeah, website yeah. and they were happy with it. But here again, you know, and it's sort of ironic, okay, so here's this. Here's this seventy-some-year-old guy telling <laughs> them what to do with QRs. Yeah. You know, you're being the change. Yeah. But yeah. you know, if you're going to be an agent of change, you have to keep up with this stuff. And so I sort of, I sort of chided them for being behind the, <laughs> <laughs> being behind the curve. So. Great. So um, you know, speaking of the the junior researchers. We're wondering what advice would you have for students who are interested in pursuing a career studying sociolinguistics and what skills do you think are most important for their success? You know, one of the things, uh, I mean people complain that there aren't that many jobs in, uh, in academics. I mean there are a few here and there, but uh, one of the things that I suggest is that students get involved in engagement while they're students. That, and, and actually there are studies that show that graduate students who do engagement work as graduate students are better off than those who don't because it gives them meaning. I mean, most people are sort of like, okay, I'm doing my studies and then I'm going to work on my dissertation and sort of going to be my work and here I am. But what we find is that uh, is that when students, you know, are drawn to the uh, language diversity ambassadors, where we give a new talk to students every month, you know, and it's on controversial topics like what is queer language, or sort of a, you know, what is Black American sign, or or things that are quite controversial, uh, and, and we uh, uh, we find that they they really feel good about them. The students like going to the freshman writing classes and chatting with them, that they actually feel more fulfilled by having some sort of engagement thing because graduate students then get so focused on their own research that it's good to have a sort of collaborative activity of that type. And, and so, you know, in my class, uh, we have a, a, a service learning component where every student is required to spend four hours at the state fair and interact with the general public and you know and talk to them about dialects answer their questions so they can see for themselves what ordinary people are thinking about dialects and then they come back and they write about it and and some of them say this was the this was the best activity of the semester others say the uh, the bus was the best thing. <laughs> <laughs> the party bus was the highlight. <laughs> Teach their own. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Great advice, though. Thank you. Um, yeah. Is there anything else that you'd like to share that we have neglected to ask you about before we uh, No, my, my feeling is this, okay? So, uh, I'm an 82 year old guy. Okay, so uh, uh, as you can see, I haven't lost much of my enthusiasm. Uh, as I often say to students, I find that the engagement part of it is the most sort of satisfying to me. If I were simply writing articles, you know, and 10 people read them, an article I took a year to do research on, 10 people read them, Five understood it, three disagreed, and two of my students agreed. That, to me, as an 82-year-old, doesn't make my day. <laughs> but, but talking to a rotary group that said, oh, I never thought that the dialects were part of our heritage. I just thought it was a hindrance to overcome being from the South and so forth. I, 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 find, that, I find that both students and I are really alive. And then one of so for example, uh, when I get back next week, the following week, I'm gonna take our graduate students down to the Vocal Coke. We've developed a curriculum that we've taught for 30 years. They're gonna spend the week, their, their, uh, their spring break, 
teaching eighth graders in Ocracoke about dialects, their own dialect, and the dialects of North Carolina. Again, many of the kids say that was the most purposeful thing I did, you know, as a master's student with you. Sort of going down there, seeing the island, seeing how people live, seeing about your relationship with them and how they've sort of embraced and have for 30 years now. Eighth graders have, have um, sort of taken this message and it's transformed their view of the dialect. It used to be, well, we're not sure, you know, people think we're dumb because we use it. And now it's, yeah, it's part of who we are, man. We're sorry that we're losing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're glad that you guys are, have it all on tape and do these oral histories and so forth. So, so, so I, I, really, I, I really would encourage people to sort of do the engagement and see how what we do is beneficial to the world. So, and that's what really inspires me. And although I probably will retire in a couple of years, and here's another thing, you know, um, as, as I say, you know, I love Monday morning because I get to do what I love that week. So I never wake up Monday morning and say, oh God, what a drudgery for a week is coming up. I get up and I'm ready to go. So if you can do that at 82, then you've found something that's an avocation rather than a job. Definitely. So that's, you know, and I, and I don't care if it's linguistic, country singer, whatever you do, you know. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you're not going to be a professional athlete at 82. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but find something that, that you love to go to and engage in. So that's, that, that's my advice about life. Yeah, I don't care if it's linguistics or not. I mean, I had four kids. They never took a course in linguistics, all right? <laughs> One of them was at Brown, where you could sort of, where you could sort of take, uh, you know, take courses and see if you like them. And she took evolution of language for a week and she wrote me a letter and said, I'm sorry, Dad, I can't take this even for you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's as close as I ever got to a kid in linguistics. <laughs> <laughs> she was honest. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, she's honest and she loves what she's doing now, you know, so. Now, and now I'll see if I get, uh, I have 12 grandkids and so far, you know, six of them, no, five of them were in college and none has taken the linguistics course. <laughs> but my, my grandson at Duke emailed me yesterday uh, when I was on my way here and said, hey, Dad. Hey, Grandpa, uh, they're showing Signing Black in America here on campus because it's uh, Deaf Awareness Week, oh, yeah. all right? And so they're showing that. I thought you'd, you'd really like that. That's cool. So it's getting out there. So it's getting yeah. out there. Right. Even if they don't take a course. And, it's, and he, yeah, and he realizes his granddad really is doing something for a living. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool, though, yeah. <laughs> I think that's great for linguistics because so many people are like, oh, I don't know what that is. Or, you know, it's like they don't know what it is until they realize it's everybody's Well, part of everybody's you know, life. The, the thing is about that film is it's really widely used in, in the sign community. And you see people's knowledge of sign language is so limited. My own son, when I, when I, we watched uh, Signing Black in America, he assumed that all sign languages were the same. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, he's an intelligent man. He's got a degree from Harvard and a graduate degree from their business college. But he, that's what he thought, and he's a son of a linguist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, but we've never had discussions about that. But when you see sort of people learning, oh, I didn't realize there are all these languages. I mean, the fact of the matter is, Sign language was not recognized as a language until the 1960s by linguists. So, so, you know, there are these issues and sort of getting this kind of knowledge out there is so essential to sort of people's knowledge and understanding. And then we can talk about sort of why African-American language would be different from other sign languages. And there's even a, the, I know you got plenty of time, right? What time? Oh yeah, we have time. Oh yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. and, and I can talk forever. <laughs> so so there, there's even a curious thing about that film, which comes from this fact, that actually, if you're sort of talking about linguistically, 
black sign language is more conservative than white sign language. And there's a reason for that. Because during the 60s and 70s, there was a push towards oral communication, right? So they weren't teaching sign language. They were trying to get everybody to sort of read lips and <laughs> determine that. Except the black community was excluded from that. So, so schools for the deaf and the black community didn't, didn't do that. So what happened was they maintained a lot of the standard ways of producing signs. So for example, signs that are now produced one-handed by whites are still produced by two hands. You know, instead of a sign up here, uh, uh, whites will now have it down here, and blacks will have it up, still have it up here. And so in a sense, in a sense, sort of if you want to, I mean, this is sort of a, a false analogy, but, but in a sense, if you want to say, okay, so they have more standardized uh, language, uh, linguistically, but black sign is stigmatized because it's black people who use it, right? <laughs> so even though linguistically it's, quote, more pure, not that anything is pure in linguistics, <laughs> but the, the fact that they maintained it and it would be considered more standard, all right, it's considered stigmatized because it's black people doing it. So, so it's a great lesson for standard English being a not a function of the language per se, but the people who right. use the language. You know, it's, so for an introductory class, you know, that doesn't understand how arbitrary standards are, here's a case. Yeah. So that's a great example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, that's my. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, uh, thank I, you again. Oh, did you? Was I going to say more? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just want to say thank you again so uh, much, well, Dr. Wolfram, for, for taking the time to sit down and talk with us today. We well, can't tell you how much we appreciate it. Well, I appreciate it because I, I believe in this stuff. So.